bear with me. Come to us, Holy Spirit, uh, to this place among these people. Speak to us today so we might hear your living voice, that we might be shaped as your people, so we might uh, gain your wisdom as Solomon did. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as I said at the beginning of the service, today is the second week in a five-week series called It's Time for a Change. Less of this and more of that. Uh, we're kind of getting at this question of how do we deal with the change in our life? No matter where you are, no matter what's going on for you right now, there's always change. Whether it's just the simple passing of time, growing older, or the changing of the seasons. And some change is good, and some change is bad. And so it always requires discernment to decide how we deal with it. It requires wisdom to decide how we are going to address or deal with change, adapt to it. And so we're kind of giving you this question for discernment. What do you want less of in your life, and what do you want more of? Or more importantly, what does God want less of in your life, and what does God want more of? What does God want less of in our world, and what does God want more of. And so we have this story today about King Solomon asking God for wisdom, and then a display of this wisdom uh, in, the, uh, in the case of judging these two women and the baby. And part of what I want to do is take this story and place it in the larger story of King Solomon, because today we kind of uh, get the high watermark of King Solomon's career. And it's not all good, it's not all bad, it's kind of a mixed bag. But today he's kind of bright and shining, this is him at his best. Humbly asking God for wisdom, and then judging fairly as king over the people. This is his time to shine. But I kind of want to place that uh, in the larger context of Solomon's story, because the larger point for me is that Solomon isn't the hero of the story, but God is. And I think placing it in a larger context will help us do that. And I think this story gives us this gift of seeking uh, less ego or less self-centeredness and seeking more humility in our life. That God wants less ego in our life and more humility. That God wants less worldly foolishness and wants more wisdom, especially holy, godly wisdom, that maybe doesn't always strike us as, as wise by worldly standards. And so like I said, uh, Solomon is, is, uh, uh, is kind of a mixed character. The whole Bible, in some senses, is kind of ambivalent about these kings. Uh, sometimes these kings are great, they are seeking the love of the Lord, they're serving the people, and a, a lot of the time, they are worshiping other gods and sinning against others. So it's kind of this story of God's ambivalence with kings. And now this is your, your brief uh, Bible lesson for today, which is why I've got my Bible with me. Uh, if you go to the very beginning when the people first asked for the king you'll, uh, in the book of Samuel, uh, you will see that uh, God wasn't so sold on the idea from the outset. It was that the people saw that all the nations around them had kings, and they wanted a king so they could be like everyone else. It's kind of like me when I was growing up. Everyone in my friend group had a Super Nintendo. So what did I go to my mom and dad and ask for? I want a Super Nintendo too. You know? <laughs> That's kind of what it was like for the people. All their friends had, uh, and enemies, had kings. Uh, and they wanted one too. And God said, well, I'm your king. Do you really need a human one? But eventually God relented and said, fine, you can have a king. But uh, way back in the, the book of Deuteronomy, and uh, it's going to have something to do with Egyptian horses. I want you to remember that, Egyptian horses. So back in the book of Deuteronomy, there was some guidance given for, okay, if you're going to have a king, there are a few rules. And this is what the book of Deuteronomy chapter 17 says. When you have come into the land, the book of Deuteronomy is written while they're in the wilderness before they enter the promised land. 
and the Lord your, that the Lord your God is giving you, and have taken possession of it and settled in it. Remember, we read the story of Joshua, how they entered the promised land, took over and settled in it. And then you say to yourselves, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. I want a Super Nintendo too, in other words. Uh, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One of your own community you may set as a king over you, and you are not permitted to put a foreigner over you who is not of your own community. Even so, here comes the list of rules for how the kings should behave. He must not acquire many horses for himself, or return the people to Egypt in order to acquire more horses, since the Lord has said to you, you must never return that way again. And he must not acquire many wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away. Also, silver and gold he must not acquire in great quantity for himself. So just to review, this king should not acquire a bunch of horses, especially should not get any horses from Egypt. This king should not get a bunch of wives, especially foreign wives, who might teach him to uh, worship foreign gods, and should not acquire a bunch of silver and gold. So remember those four rules. And now we're going to jump ahead to 1 Kings, which is where our story is from today. This is a little bit later, but just to kind of give you an idea of Solomon's reign. So this is from chapter 10. Solomon <laughs> gathered together chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, which he stationed in the chariots, chariot cities with the king in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and he made cedars as numerous as the sycamores of Shephelah. Solomon's import, here's the, uh, an important detail, Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt. <laughs> so remember, it had something to do with Egyptian horses. So the four rules were, uh, you shouldn't have much horses, Solomon has 12,000, <laughs> so a few. Uh, you shall not get them from Egypt, it says right here that he sent people to import uh, horses from Egypt. And the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. So he, he, he checked off three boxes there. And remember the fourth one was he shouldn't have a bunch of wives. So just jumping ahead a little bit here. King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh. Among his wives were 700 princesses and 300 concubines. And his wives turned to him. So, uh, <laughs> you got your four rules. Uh, he, he, uh, you know, had more wealth than he could than he could possibly ever spend. He had more horses than he could possibly ever ride, and he also was in a relationship with about a thousand women, many of whom it says here were leading him to worship foreign gods. My point being, I'm not just trying to drag Solomon through the mud here. Uh, my point is, is when we read these stories, we tend to turn Solomon and David and all these characters into heroes that we're meant to emulate. But part of the beauty of the Bible is that we're not given perfect people. We're given uh, realistic descriptions of how people are. Uh, and that God still finds a way to remain faithful to work through those people. We're reminded that Solomon is not our hero, but God is. That it's not the wisdom of Solomon necessarily, but it's the wisdom that God gave Solomon. It's God's wisdom. That we're not here to worship Solomon. We're here to worship the God that Solomon also worshipped. God is the hero of our story. So like I said at the beginning, uh, this is the story that we read for today is Solomon's high watermark. He wasn't always faithful. He didn't always do what God wanted him to do. We might read those things, and I think sometimes there's a temptation to be impressed with how... Uh, rich Solomon's kingdom was, but I think we're actually supposed to be a little suspicious because we're reminded that that's not actually what God wanted for the kingdom of Israel. But I think Solomon's story teaches us that when he's at his best, he's at his most humble. Here he is in chapter 3 of 1 Kings, and he recognizes that as a young man, uh, maybe, you know, 18, 20 year old, you can imagine a uh, senior in high school taking over as king of a, of a nation or something like that. Uh, Bible study talks about you know, 
big Davis Dixon taking over, <laughs> uh, taking over the kingdom. Uh, he recognizes that he can't do it alone, that he needs God's guidance. He needs God's wisdom. And so when God comes to him in a dream and says, what is it that you want? He says, I can't do it without you, God. I need your wisdom. So this story teaches us that we need more humility in our life. We need, like Solomon in that moment, to open our hands and to receive from God. Solomon at his worst is when he's at his most egotistical. One of the other you know, high watermarks for Solomon is that he builds the temple. And uh, that's a great thing in, in a lot of ways. It's where God's presence comes and dwells on the earth for the people. Uh, but we're given this kind of strange detail that Solomon spent seven years building a house for God, the temple, and he spent 13 years building a palace for himself. So you can uh, read that in a couple ways. You know, maybe he was more urgently building a house for God and was taking his time with his own palace. Or you could also say uh, he spent more time building his palace than he was concerned building a house for God. The other thing he did when he built the temple is he decided to use slave labor. And remember, throughout our Old Testament story, God is trying to set up a new way that's different from the Egyptian way. The people were slaves in Egypt, and God said, you're going to be a new free people who doesn't live like the Egyptians live. But uh, when I was traveling in the Holy Land a couple years ago, we flew into Tel Aviv, which is on the coast. And Jerusalem is high up from the sea level. It's like one of the highest points from sea level in the whole country. And so when we were flew into Tel Aviv, our tour guide was telling us that this is where the cedars of Lebanon uh, that Solomon used to build the temple would, be, would have been floated down the water, floated down the sea uh, to the coast, and then they would have been hauled all the way from Tel Aviv uphill to Jerusalem. And how did Solomon do that? <coughs> and you know, we were in a bus, and I was trying to imagine hauling lumber from the sea to one of the highest points. So it's almost as if Solomon, who was trying to be a king like his father David, started to become more and more like Pharaoh, the one who had oppressed him in Egypt. So, God, so we see Solomon at his most humble, we see him at his most egotistical, and it invites us into this discernment. How can we invite more humility like Solomon into our life, and how can we have less uh, self-centeredness, egoism? like Solomon. The other discernment that this story teaches us is that we worship a God who works through sinners, who works through imperfect people like you and like me. Uh, today, we're, we're a little bit muted today. Uh, last, last year was the 500th uh, anniversary of the Reformation. This year is the 501st anniversary of uh, the Reformation, so it's not a big of a deal. But today is the closest Sunday to Reformation Day on October 31st, which is the day that Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the church wall, uh, to the church door at Wittenberg. And uh, so we remember today that witness of Martin Luther, and part of that witness is that God makes us simultaneously saints and sinners. I think sometimes we like to divide the world into those are sinners over there and these are saints over here. What Martin Luther says is that we are both saints and sinners at the same time. No matter how high up the spiritual ladder we think we're climbing, we're still a sinner in need of God's grace. And no matter how far down we go uh, in our sin, we are never beyond God's power to save us. We are simultaneously saint and sinner at the same time. And so we can look at Solomon and not turn him into a hero, but remember that he is a saint claimed by God, used by God, and a sinner in need of God's grace and wisdom and love and peace. And the same goes for Martin Luther. On Reformation Sunday, we tend to turn him into a hero. But a day after this horrible shooting out at a synagogue, we remember that one of the great sins of Martin Luther was his anti-Semitism. Late in his life, he wrote some awful things about our Jewish neighbors. There was a particular tract called On the Jews and Their Lies. The horrible stuff. And uh, when Nazis started to take over Germany in the 1930s and 40s, 
Who did they turn to as their source of authority? They started to quote Martin Luther and said, hey, this is justification for what we want to do. So he was a deeply flawed person. He wasn't a hero because God is our hero. He was a sinner and a saint. And that's why in that reading today from Elizabeth Eaton, uh, she quoted from the 1994 statement from the ELCA to the Jewish community. In 1994, the ELCA put out a statement saying, we renounce those things that Martin Luther said about Jewish people. He does not speak for us. We celebrate his witness to the gospel, but we renounce his anti-Semitism. So Solomon is a sinner and a saint. Martin Luther is a sinner and a saint. You and I are simultaneously sinners and saints. And the miraculous thing is that God works through us to bring God's love into the world. No matter how imperfect we are. So the final piece of the sermon is that we're taught to seek more wisdom in our life and less foolishness. And I think we could turn Solomon's prayer into our prayer. We could open our hands and say, God, grant us wisdom. <clears throat> One of my favorite prayers is the serenity prayer, which is often prayed at the end of Alcoholic Anonymous meetings and other addiction recovery groups. And that prayer goes, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That there are things about our lives, there are things changing in our world that we just can't do anything about. And so we ask God to give us peace to accept those things. You know, I'd like to be able to dunk a basketball. That will not probably happen, right? So you just have to accept those things at some point. But then there are certain things that we can do about, we can do to change. Uh, for example, we could do something to let our Jewish neighbors know that we care about them. May God give us the courage to do that. And may God give us wisdom to be able to tell the difference between those two things. The things we cannot change and the things we can. So may God grant you wisdom. May God remind us that even when we're sinners, we're still a saint in God's eyes on account of Jesus Christ. And that we don't need to look for heroes uh, in each other or even in our great biblical characters. Because God is the hero of our Bible. God is the hero of our story. And Jesus is the Savior of our world.